so near yet so far. They've put on an impressive performance in their Group C matches, but the Super Eagles still have a fight on their hands for a quarter-final spot at the Africa Nations Championship. Tonight, we speak to the Nigeria Eagles coach and former playing legend, Sunday Olise. Hello and a very warm welcome to Match Point this week. This is the program here on CCTV Africa that brings you fresh perspectives on both African and global sport. I'm Mahia Mutua. Here's what we have for you tonight. South Africa Marathon hopefuls sharpen their skills under the watchful eye of long-distance legend Hendrik Ramala. And we look at how the game of boxing is gaining popularity among women in Zambia. Well, Nigeria topped their group at this year's Africa Nations Championship, but they will need to avoid defeat against Guinea in their last group game to avoid leaving their dreams of a quarter-final appearance to chance. This is Nigeria's second appearance in the competition reserved for domestic-based players, and they will hope to improve on their third-place finish from the 2014 edition. For their coach, Chan 2016 offers a chance to silence critics who have often questioned Sunday Olikse's coaching abilities. He spoke to Cel Celestine Karone. The ongoing African Nations Championship in Rwanda is Sunday Ulysses' first tournament in charge since taking over as Nigeria coach. Super Eagles members who play their club football at home got off to a flying start with a 4-1 win over Niger before sharing the spoils with Tunisia. They face Guinea in their final group game with a place in the last eight at stake. Coach Olise's agenda at Chan goes beyond just winning the title. The end um, focus for me is, is to get a solid team out of this. And because our end objective is try to be in, to be in the World Cup for 2018 for Nigeria and also to qualify for the 2017 um, African Cup of Nations. The former defensive midfielder was appointed coach in July last year. As a player, he won the 1994 Africa Cup of Nations and the Olympics in 1996 during Nigeria's golden era in the sport. The 41-year-old says his desire to coach was nurtured while playing at Dutch side Ajax in 1997. But when the Nigerian Football Federation came calling, he wasn't quick to accept the offer. I showed it the first day. They called back the second day. I refused it. And it was midnight the third day that, uh, that we called again and they were quite persistent and then I really looked upon it and uh, I had to ask the permission of my family really. And especially my son was like, Pa, you're always watching Nigeria, you're always uh, checking the mail, uh, checking the internet for what's happening there. Yeah. Go, go change something for them. How has the job been since you took over last year? Since um, I've been in charge, we've had 12 games. We've lost only one. We've considered only four goals. And we've scored over 16 or 18 goals, I think. I think. Uh, you know, and uh, won seven. So it's like, and drawn four. So you see, it's uh, normally you shouldn't even be, in, be questioned as regards how it's going. But that is Nigeria. People have to sell newspapers. Olise's critics are often quick to point out his unimpressive coaching CV, which lists a Belgian third division club as his only other tactician position before taking charge of Nigeria. Tell us some of the work you are doing with uh, the domestic players in Nigeria to help raise the standards of a football in the country. I have an idea of what uh, international football standards requires of a player playing on each position. So what I just try to do is, like these guys, who are, their ambitions are to go the step further, is to like equip them with, look, make them aware. This is what you have to do if you play this position. If you do this, this is what you have to do. And this is what your colleague has to do while you are doing that. Over the years, did the over-dependence on foreign-based players affect the development of leagues back home in Nigeria? Uh, you know, it's funny you're saying this, because it was actually one of the first things I considered when I took the job. Because um, we had the golden generation, which I was a part of. There were sometimes we didn't need a coach. Because the, we had so much talented players that in some difficult occasions, we introduced what we were doing at our clubs. Now, if you're going to bring in foreign-based players, and they are not actually playing at that highest level, um, sometimes 
I feel there is not much an advantage you can put over them over the, the home base players. After a successful period as a player for the Super Eagles, Olise is now mapping out the kind of legacy he would like to leave as a coach. A coach who, um, who has clear ideas, who makes his players, um, brings the best out of his players, you know, and also at the same time, hopefully, when the time comes and you have to wave your and say I'm done, you leave something viable for the person taking over. Should the Super Eagles fail to qualify for the 2017 Cup of Nations or the 2018 World Cup, Olise says he will walk away. For now, he has an opportunity to win his first major trophy as coach at Chan. Selassie Karone, CCTV, in Kigali, Rwanda. Right to South Africa now, where sports betting, like the world over, is an industry that runs 365 days a year, with millions of rand worth of bets being placed every single day. But when sports betting has a chance to influence the outcome of a result, then the sport and many other punters suffer. It is not a new phenomenon, but it is starting to become more and more prevalent with the amount of money on offer. This time, South Africa's domestic T20 cricket competition has fell victim to the scourge that is match fixing. CS Duplessis now reports. Match fixing has reared its ugly head yet again in South African cricket. This time, over a decade since the last scandal, former international batsman Kulam Bodhi has been charged under the Cricket South Africa Anti-Corruption Code for attempting to influence eight players in the domestic T20 competition. But the full extent of the problem has not yet been revealed, with 47 names reportedly being linked to the ongoing investigation. The Star newspaper's chief cricket writer, Stuart Hess, says he is astounded by the developments. Cricket has had to, to deal with this now for a very, very long time. Um, of course, we had a very famous incident in South Africa 15 years ago with Hansi Kronier. Uh, we learned some painful lessons out of that. Um, it's now cropped up. Its, its head is, is reared up once again. Um, and, yeah, cricket needs to be vi vigilant. And, and cricket South Africa have been, uh, as, far as, as far as it's concerned. From, from their perspective, you know, they seem to feel that their systems have worked. The, the big concern is just how deep does it go. Cricket South Africa is working on getting all the details of the match-fixing scandal together, but has confirmed that Bodhi is the intermediary and that the 37-year-old has been suspended pending further evidence. And for the cricketer born in India who immigrated to South Africa, jail time is a reality. For Hess, though, it's sad that actions like Bodhi's tarnish a game desperate to clean up its image. Bodhi is, is cooperating with Cricket South Africa. Um, but are the names that we are hearing just about guys who, who, who Bodhi happened to have a conversation with? Um, were they guys that Bodhi gave money to? Were, did these guys, upon hearing this from, from, from Bodhi, then report him to Cricket South Africa's authorities? And these are things that we just don't know because those areas of the investigation um, haven't been made public yet. The problem is something that has cricket authorities in South Africa very concerned. And now that the domestic T20 competition is televised all over the world, there are concerns that more bookmakers will be aiming to influence and fix the outcome of other matches in future. You know, the, the scale of these things, it, it needs to be properly investigated. I think Cricket South Africa, uh, and, and credit needs to go to them because they did flag this initially back in November, um, is that they need to be very careful about how they conduct this investigation. They need to be absolutely sure of their facts. They need to be absolutely sure what took place, when it took place, so that there is clarity about it. So when this eventually does end up in, in the courts, um, they have all their facts in order, all their ducks in a row, because um, that's the only way that, that this will be cleaned out of the game and out of that competition. 3% of all South Africans gamble in some shape or form. It's a multi-billion rand industry that continues to grow every year. So it's no wonder that the money coming into sports betting could influence some players to try and affect the outcome of games. Cricket South Africa has a massive task at hand to eradicate the individuals responsible for these acts if they are to make sure the sport is clean once and for all. CS Duplessis, CCTV, Johannesburg. Well, let's take you back to the African Nations Championships in Rwanda. We can give you an update on the matches played today. Uh, Zambia defeated Uganda one goal to nil, and they are now the third team to qualify for the quarterfinals of the competition. Earlier on, uh, Zimbabwe were playing Mali, and they lost one nil by the same scoreline, one nil to the Malians. Well, earlier on, of course, we did speak to Sunday Olise, the head coach of the Nigeria Super Eagles. Let's get you some more perspective 
on Nigeria's prospects in Rwanda. We can now go live to Lagos, Nigeria, where we are joined by Toby Olubi, our football coach and analyst there. Now, Toby, uh, talking about Nigeria's chances, they, they do have one win and a draw so far in the competition. Uh, they face Guinea next in Group C. What are their chances of actually reaching their first Chan final? Well, I think um, the, the Super Eagles have a very um, solid chance to qualify because um, a, a win and a draw four points, they currently top the group. Uh, we're gaining second place, having scored more goals than uh, Tunisia. Tunisia are actually the toughest team in the group. The, the boys were able to get uh, a, a decent uh, draw against Tunisia. So I think it just shows that they're ready for this chance 2016. And with, with the look of things, if they can get at least a point against Guinea in the third, uh, in the third final, uh, group stage game. I think uh, they'll be able to qualify out of the group uh, to, to be able to meet either Zambia or Mali who finally qualifies from Group D. Uh, now, Toby, obviously earlier we, we spoke to Sunday Olise. What is the perception in Nigeria, though, uh, by Nigerians of Sunday Olise as a coach? Is he on the right path or does he need more time? Yes, he's on, he's on the right path. Uh, Sunday Olise has done very well, in my own opinion. Uh, for the Super Eagles, uh, just a couple of sluggish results, if I must say, uh, a defeat at home to Congo, uh, but and a couple of draws that, that um, the Nigerian faithful felt were were um, avoidable. But in my own opinion, I think uh, he's, he's been doing well so far. He has said it from the beginning that he's building a team, so we should give him that time to build a solid team, and hopefully uh, he will start by winning the chance or at least getting into the final for the first time uh, in our two uh, editions that we've participated he will qualify for the World Cup and also the Nations Cup. So I believe uh, he just needs a little bit of patience from the Nigerian faithfuls and Sunday Olize would um, deliver us the, the silver we've been looking for. All right. Uh, finally, Toby, obviously we all know about the Nigeria of the 90s. And uh, uh, in recent times, of course, they won the Africa Cup of Nations in 2013, but they haven't been able uh, to win a major tournament since. Is it time now to look to locally based players for the Super Eagles in the future? Well, locally based players have always been involved with the Super Eagles um, in the last couple of years, starting from the time of uh, Coach Stephen Keshi, the former coach. Uh, if you would remember, uh, when, he, when, when he went to the uh, World Cup in Brazil, uh, he went with a couple of home-based players, and most of them were based on their performances at the Champ 2014. So uh, locally based players will definitely play a part in the Eagles team, and this is, uh, the Champ tournament is a, is a very good stepping stone for them, the best of the lot in the Champ definitely will make the cut uh, into the Super Eagles, going into the qualifiers later, into the year, uh, later in the year. So um, I believe the locally based players will get their chance. Definitely they will get their chance. Toby Olubi, thank you very much for speaking to us there. That was a football coach and analyst, Toby Olubi, speaking to us live from Lagos, Nigeria. Well, it's time for us to take a short break here on Match Point. Here's what's coming up. South Africa Marathon hopefuls sharpen their skills under the watchful eye of long-distance legend Henrik Ramala. Welcome back. Now all eyes are set on the Rio 2016 Olympics as two South African marathon runners and one former legend dream of making the team heading to Brazil for the Games. CCTV's Julie Shire has more. South African legend Hendrik Ramala is a four-time Olympian, has twice placed second at the World Half Marathon Championship and won the 2004 New York Marathon. Ramala is now coaching a group of local marathon hopefuls ahead of the 2016 Rio Games. And he's aiming to help as many athletes as possible qualify for the Olympics. We have the, the dream team members, we call them. So we have uh, Lungile Konga, we have Tolisa Chale, we have Sibusi Sonzima, and then we have Michael Mazibugo. Th those are the, the marathon potential. They've run the times, we want them to, to show again that they can repeat and you know, solidify their spaces in the Olympic team. 
we started this program uh, or the project back in 2015, June. So we made sure we start earlier. And then guys ran well in Cape Town Marathon in September. They ran some decent times under the Olympic qualifying times. And then the guys started believing. This is the first time Ramala is coaching a team for the Olympics, and the pressure to reach that goal is on. I can't believe I, all this talent came to me to ask for, you know, to be coached. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to get them to Rio, to, you know, to make that dream come true. The Olympics is the biggest dream for me because it's the last stage. I, I, I qualify for the old world. I want to qualify for the Olympics now. It will be a special thing to me and my country. I'll be a proudly South African if I can be able to hold one of the medals at the Olympics because I know it will change my life. It will make South Africa and I'll be happy with everything that will happen in my life. Ramallah with a season best time of 2.17.12 has not ruled himself out of contention for Rio 2016. I know if I, I push my, my body harder and focus on the on the dream of making the team. Uh, I believe I can. I still believe. But uh, the priority now is more my athletes than me. So if it happens, it will be just, you know, by chance. I'm more focused on them making the team. I'll be more pleased if they make the team before I do it. Ramal and his team have until the end of April to see if they are selected for Rio 2016 but he's convinced that all the hard work and all the mileage that's been put in will take them to the Olympics. Julie Shire, CCTV, Johannesburg. Let's turn back to football now. Qualifying for next year's Africa Cup of Nations in Gabon continues this March. Oldes Cote d'Ivoire will be looking to get their campaign back on track after managing just two points in two games. But one of their players is certain the team is on the right track as CCTV's Dan Williams now reports from Spain. At just 21, Eric Bailey has the world at his feet. The Côte d'Ivoire defender has become a key player at Spanish side Villarreal, helping the team climb into the top four of the La Liga standings. And he's relishing the opportunity of testing himself against the finest players in world football. Here in La Liga, for the name, we have... Here in the La Liga, we have the best forwards, including the best player in the world. As you say, there is Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo and other forwards. And in my case, I just try to defend, to help the team, so that those forwards do not have a lot of influence when you play against them. But it's not just at club level that Bailey has made an impact. Last year, he was a key member of the Côte d'Ivoire team that won the Africa Cup of Nations, converting one of the spot kicks that saw his side beat Ghana 9-8 on penalties in the final. It was the country's first continental title since 1992. The victory meant a lot. It meant a change in the country, because football can bring people together. I think that the victory was a very important win for the country as well. The country has suffered through a lot of things, politics, and in the end, we managed to bring a lot of happiness to the country. Cote d'Ivoire's success last year was inspired by their captain, Yaya Torre. Although the Manchester City midfielder is now 32, his influence on the national team remains clear. Yaya Toure is a fantastic player in terms of African football and world football. He's one of the best central midfielders in the world, and the truth is, he brings a lot to the team. He's a great captain on and off the pitch. And with me, he's been like a brother off the pitch, who gives advice to all young guys who've just started, for whom it was just a first experience. He's given me a lot. It's been a memorable 12 months or so for Eric, establishing himself at the heart of defence for both club and country. But his focus now is on the future and taking his career to a whole new level.
for Cote d'Ivoire. The immediate focus is on reaching and then defending their Africa Cup of Nations trophy in Gabon next year. Yeah, I think so. With this new team that we have, we are hard working. It is a young team that wants to learn and be the best that it can be, and that requires a lot of work. I think with the young team that we have, we're going to get where we want with the Ivory Coast national team. There are young players there like Seji Orie at PSG, for example, and the other young players we have, and we hope this team can grow a lot in the years ahead. Bailey may have enjoyed an impressive 2015, but he hopes that is just the beginning. Dan Williams, CCTV, Villarreal, Spain. Well, let's take another quick break. You're watching Match Point, but don't go anywhere. Here's what's still to come. We'll be looking at how the game of boxing is gaining popularity among women in Zambia. Boxing, that bloody, brutal and fierce sport, not something for the faint-hearted and in Zambia apparently not something for women until 2003. That's when the country's first female boxer came on the scene. She's never looked back and since then many more have joined the fray. Grueling training, the stuff world beaters are made of. Among the aspiring champions are Alison Bewe and Margaret Temple part of a growing number of women, punching their way through the stereotypes. Boxing is, is for everyone. Women, girls can do boxing, also men can do boxing. They're not just making up the numbers either. Alice has her sights set on a spot at the Rio Olympics. I'm expecting a gold medal from the Olympics and I want to put Zambia, I want to um, raise a, a Zambian flag. Her moment of truth will come in February when she fights for qualification. If there's a chance of taking them qualifiers, they, they, they will qualify. I'm talking this because I'm talking from of competition in the Olympics and my boxers are very ready to compete with anyone in the world. Blood, sweat, and even tears have been shed inside this gym as young boxers chase their dreams. For the girls, the person they want to be in those dreams is this woman. Esther Piri is a trailblazer who changed the rules. Here it was illegal because we never had like uh, female boxing. And by the time I came into boxing, and then I think my, my manager, my coach, maybe they went to propose to the government and to amend the, uh, the, 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 box, the female boxing to, to, to take place in, in Zambia. That was back in 2003, just after she made her fortuitous entry into the sport. While working out to lose weight at a local gym, her potential was discovered. Yeah, I was very strong, and one of the guys said, yeah, I think this girl, she's very strong, she can be a good boxer. It's how even I met my coach, Anton. She has taken on 20 opponents and has a 75% win rate. She's racked up multiple world titles and inspired a generation while at it. After 12 years in the ring, she feels there's still plenty of fight in her, but is planning the next round in her life. Yeah, of course, two opportunity I can go and fight. And yeah, I've got talent, God given. And but the most thing I want to do, I want to go back to to school. Her legacy intact, she can leave the sport knowing there are many following in her footsteps. Farai Mokutuya, CCTV, Lusaka, Zambia. Well, finally, 2016 is an important year for sport, not just because of the Olympics, but also because it's a Paralympic year.
The Summer Paralympic Games were first held in 1960 in Rome, Italy, with the first African nation taking part six years later in Tokyo, Japan. This week on the Matchpoint Top 5 segment, we tally the medal winners at the Paralympic Games by country, starting at number 5. Fifth with 57 medals in total is Algeria. The North African nation has participated in six Summer Paralympics to date. In that time, won 19 gold, 13 silver and 25 bronze. That marks a large progression for Algeria, who sent just eight athletes to their first edition, the 1992 Barcelona Games, and came home empty-handed. Fourth on our all-time Paralympics medal table is Zimbabwe. The Southern African nation first took part in the 1980 Paralympics in Arnhem, the Netherlands, soon after gaining independence. That turned out to be the country's most successful outing, taking 12 medals in total. Since then, they have increased that tally to 69 medals in total. Tunisia had a humble introduction to the Paralympic Games dating back to 1988 in Seoul. On that occasion, the country sent just one athlete, Monam El Abed, who returned home with two bronze medals. The North African nation had to wait until the 2000 Sydney Games to win gold for the first time, earning six on that occasion, and since then has claimed 32 gold medals. Add 28 silver and 14 bronze to that tally, and Tunisia comes in at number three on our list, with an impressive total of 74 medals to date. Fellow North Africans Egypt come in at number two. Notably known for athletics and powerlifting events, Egypt has taken part in every Summer Paralympics since 1976 in Toronto. To date, the country's best performance was at the 1996 Atlanta Games, where they took 30 medals in total. With 45 gold, 43 silver and 55 bronze, Egypt is one of two African countries in triple digits on the overall medal standings. 143 medals and counting, Egypt has never finished worse than 35th overall, which was the case in Seoul. And at number one is South Africa. The Rainbow Nation's first appearance was at the 1964 Summer Games in Tokyo, Japan, where they sent nine athletes. In fact, South Africa's appearance at the Paralympics coincided with the country being banned from the Olympic Games in 1962 due to apartheid. The country continued to feature since then, except for the three editions in the 80s, and has gone on to dominate Africa's performance. 280 medals to date, 110 gold, 88 silver, and 82 bronze, mean South Africa are the most decorated African country in the history of the Paralympic Games. Well, that does it for this edition of Matchpoint. Remember, we'd love to hear from you. Send your feedback to matchpoint at cctv.com. You can also visit our Facebook page, CCTV Africa, and drop a comment or stay in touch with us on Twitter. The handle is CCTV News Africa. Thanks for watching. We leave you with ten tennis images, and it's the Australian Open. And at the center of it, Serena Williams, who made history with her 80th main draw match at the Australian Open and her 71st win in Melbourne.